been on a journey through Hebrews, an amazing book that declares the greatness of Jesus. The more I preach, the more I just want to preach Jesus. If I could go back, I would have preached a whole lot more Jesus, less topical, you know, self-help pep talks, and more me to the word Jesus. Amen. It starts out, God who in time past has spoken to us through the prophets in these last days, has spoken to us by his son. And he takes off declaring the glories of Jesus, how he's greater than the angels. He's greater than the prophets. He continues to the point of saying he's greater than Moses. He's greater than Joshua. He's greater than the sacrifices in the temple. When we get done with this book, we'll be amazed at all that we've learned. We've learned last week he's a great high priest. Do you know you have a high priest in heaven? Jesus, who ever lives to make intercession for you. I believe this is a transcribed sermon or sermon series. That's why it's so unusual the way it's written. So we're breaking into the paragraph, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, talking about Jesus. And having been perfected through the things he suffered, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now he's going to talk about that more in chapter 7. He says, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Now he shifts gears out of concern for the spiritual condition of the hearers of this sermon, of the readers of this book. And therefore, this book is as relevant today as ever was. Talk about a dole of hearing people. They could care less what the Word of God says. They could care less that Jesus has given gifts to us, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. They could care less that we are to be equipped for our ministry They just want a pep talk and go on and let me do my God thing this month and leave Jesus out of my personal life. Our culture really wants to cram Jesus into your religious segment in your life, in your church buildings, where he has no influence in the marketplace. Where did that start? I think that started in the church. We as a people kind of of liked it that way ourselves. Some church services... The best thing about them is when they're over. It's like like the end of a sauna. There's this sense of relief, that rush you get that you can't get unless you go to church. May God help us not be that kind of church. So he goes on and approaches them on their personal condition. We got to put ourselves in the seat listening to the preacher. Verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. Can you imagine someone who's been in college long enough to be a teacher and they still don't know the alphabet? That's what he's saying. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So these people aren't even drinking the milk of God's word. They may be obsessed with the mark of the beast and who the Antichrist is, but they're not even sipping on the milk of God's word, much less the solid food. For everyone, verse 13, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What is he saying? We need the milk of God's word. And we don't need to stay there. We need to move on to the solid food, the meat of God's word. So that we can discern right from wrong. Some people don't know a false prophet from a true one. Because there's no biblical foundation. They don't know a a toxic church from a healthy one because the foundation of God's word in their life 
is either milk only or no milk at all. May the Lord help us. Go on, next chapter. Keep in mind the chapters were put there so we could find passages quickly. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary of Christ, the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. So he's challenging them to drink milk and move on to solid food so that they can begin to mature. It's a glorious day when your baby moves from milk to that first bite of something. That's a sign of growth. So therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again, and he lays out the basics here, the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Six things, or as I understand them, three pairs of things. Two are foundational, repentance from dead works, faith towards God. Four of them are doctrinal or teaching. And the pairs are laying on of hands and baptisms and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. He wants to go on and teach something besides the basics if the Lord lets him. Now, why wouldn't the Lord let him? Doesn't the Lord want us to mature? Yes. But why wouldn't the Lord let him? Why why say that? The Lord would not want him to go on if those foundations were not laid in people's lives. So today we're going to make sure we at least get a taste of what our foundation is. Why is this important? So that we don't fall away. Verse 4, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. That's several things there. One, they were enlightened. Two, they tasted the heavenly gift. Three, they were partakers of the Holy Spirit. Four, they tasted the Word of God. Five, they tasted the powers of the age to come. It is impossible that they've had these things if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now churches have fought over those scriptures. There are preachers that would love to just skip over that part. They try to, I mean, they're on YouTube today trying to explain it away. It is what it is. The hyper-eternal security people, wow, wow. They, they say, well, this is for people that never were saved. Really? Tasted the power of the age to come. Tasted the Holy Spirit. Partakers of the word. All these significant things. And then it causes the hyper insecurity people as well. Because they believe you can lose your salvation like that. But you can always get it back. Pray back through, brother. Pray back through. But here... If you look at this literally, if you lose it, you're done. What's the deal? The the key is in understanding the book is called Hebrews for a reason. It's written for Jewish believers in Jesus as their Messiah. If they do that and then turn back to the old covenant and reject the first covenant, they're done. It's in their law. They're cut off if they don't observe certain laws, right? So here, this is the importance, rather than getting obsessed with that and fighting about it, it's the importance of having a foundation so you don't fall away, right? But I believe it's really speaking to Hebrew believers. If they fall away and go back to their roots and reject the new covenant, that the old covenant opened the way for them to receive. It's not good. There's no other way. You see that? And here it is. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. In other words, Jesus died for nothing. Jesus should have died because he was a blasphemer. 
I mean, this is renouncing the gospel. For the earth drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is burned. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. So maybe you've not been following the Lord like you should. Don't entertain for a moment that you have lost your salvation. You have not renounced the living Christ. You've not counted his death as nothing. Put him to an open shame. And the fact you're concerned about it is an indicator you need to repent and obey the Holy Spirit. You got it? Now, on to the sermon. The foundation, the elementary principles of Christ. Literally, the elementaries of Christ. What are they? Here they are. Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith towards God. Now, some people attempt to explain these away. Well, we're not supposed to lay that again, so let's not go over it. Oh, really? Once it was laid in the church, there's no, no, no longer a reason to review? What about your life personally? Have you ever heard or gone through these principles and studied them? There are also those that preach and teach that uh, this is Old Testament stuff and not for us today. So he's saying, don't go back to the Old Testament. He is saying that. But these are the principles of who? Christ. What did Christ do for us? He gave us a new covenant. These are his principles. They're based in the old covenant, but they have new covenant reality. Repentance and faith has always been the way God relates to mankind. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He turned from the wickedness of his generation. That is repentance. And if anybody had faith, he did. To work for 100 years on a boat in a place that had never seen rain. (laughs) Big enough to inhabit all that it was built for. He is a man of faith. Repentance and faith, right? Abraham turned from his father's house, turned from the idolatry of his, of his kinfolk to follow the will of the one true God. That's repentance. Faith, oh my goodness, was his faith tested. Repentance and faith. We see it in the life of Isaac. We see it in the life of Jacob. We see it in the life of Joseph and his brothers. And we see it in the life of Moses who brought the Torah. He turned from the wickedness of Pharaoh. He chose to not enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, for the things he believed in. So God has always related to us through repentance and faith. At the fall of man in the garden, there was no repentance. It was blaming. The woman you gave me, the devil made me. Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. There is repentance and faith. On the day of Pentecost, when the church was born, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the followers of Jesus, those that had repented and believed in him. And Peter preached the first gospel message, declared the glory of the resurrection, compared Jesus to David which was awesome. David's tomb was inhabited. Jesus' tomb was empty. A lot of people don't know this, but the anniversary of David's death is on the day of Pentecost or Shavuot, the same day. So it was on their minds. And when they asked them, what shall we do? It was because they were convicted in their heart. They believed what they heard. And so the next step for them was repent. 
So there's repentance and faith right there. And of course, he goes on and tells them to be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So this is our foundation. Not let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance and faith. If you don't believe in the Lord or you've not turned from your wickedness, this foundation is not in your life. But if you have, it's time to go on. Let's go on. Stop going around the circle. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. We do believe in him. Now let's obey him, right? All right. So the foundation is of repentance and faith. And then verse 2, not laying again the foundation of repentance and faith. Verse 2, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands. This related to the old covenant and relates to the new covenant. The old covenant had washings. They had mikvahs. The priest uh, had hands laid on them when they were ordained into the priesthood. They laid hands on animals that were going to represent them in their sacrifices. There were hands laid on uh, people to be kings. And the new covenant comes, Jesus comes, and look what he says. Go into the whole world, proclaim the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized, obviously he's repenting, will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. If you baptize an unbeliever, it does no good. They just get wet. So you got to believe first, right? And you don't have to manipulate people to get baptized. If they really believe, they're going to want to. Ask them if they say no, well then don't. Force them because you're going to baptize unbelievers. It happens all the time. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak with new languages, receiving the Holy Spirit. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. There's a... um, African preacher I met when I was a boy in Fossima, Liberia. His father-in-law hated him. His father-in-law had like 30 wives, and for some reason he didn't like him out of all his kids. In fact, he was a Christian and tried to poison him more than once. It never worked. If they drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. Nothing can happen to you unless the Lord allows it to. And if he does, it's for a higher purpose. So, repentance and faith, and then the teaching about baptisms and laying on of hands. Let's talk about baptisms. This caused people problems because of this verse. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. What's this baptisms thing? If there's only one baptism, why does the Hebrews preacher say baptisms, plural? One God and Father of all who's above all, through all, and in you all. Well, the key is in finding out what is this one baptism he's talking about in Ephesians 4. And we get a clue in 1 Corinthians 12. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. This is salvation, where the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sins, brings you to a place of faith and repentance. And at that point, he baptizes you into the body of Christ. This is not water baptism. This is not spirit baptism. This is body of Christ baptism. There's one baptism into the body of Christ. Do you see that? So you don't have to get saved over and over again. Just repent if you need to. So let's look at the doctrine of baptisms, the plural baptisms. You have the Old Testament, the washings, the mikvahs. You have John the Baptist who closed out the Old Testament, bringing the new. And then the baptism into the body of Christ. We just saw that in the scripture we just read in 1 Corinthians 12. There's water baptism and spirit baptism and the baptism of fire. 
John the Baptist baptized people in water. He said, there's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to untie. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, there's three things that go with every baptism, whatever kind it is. There's the baptism itself, there's the baptizer, and there's the baptized, or the baptizee, or in some circles, the baptismal candidate. (laughs) So the baptism in the Old Covenant, washings, priests had to be washed before they were ordained. There was a laver of water in the temple and in the tabernacle. Water was used, washing, uh, even in those who practice the Torah to this day. So many days out of the month, a woman is considered unclean, and she has to go to the mikvah every month and be immersed to be cleansed. And in current practices I know of, she does it herself in a spa-like setting. Yeah, so it's not torture, but it can be an inconvenience in mikvahs. John the baptizer, he baptized people that repented of their wicked ways in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Repent! Make his path straight. There's one coming greater than me. Get your house in order. Preparing the way for the Messiah. And his baptistry was the Jordan River. And everybody that goes to the Holy Land wants to be baptized in the Jordan River. So John the Baptist was the baptizer in that. And the baptized was the Jews who wanted to be prepared for the Messiah. Baptism in the body of Christ is the church, the people of God, the people who relate to Jesus as their head. And the Holy Spirit is the baptizer. And the baptized is the person who believes in the Lord. They've turned from selfish ways to follow the Lord. Any baptized folks in the place? You may not have known it. I was baptized into the body of Christ. I didn't even know it. I was just a five-year-old kid singing, come into my heart. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And I'm I'm experiencing the Lord, and the Lord baptizes me into his body, and I didn't even know it until years later. Does that mean it didn't happen? Yes, it did. Asking Jesus into your heart seems rather juvenile. It's hard to prove scripturally, but there is a verse in Corinthians. That Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. And John did say, as many as received him, to him gave he the right to become the sons of God. And so when you receive the Lord, when you give him your life, because you believe in him and you've turned from self-willed ways, you are made part of the body of Christ. And the baptizer is the Holy Spirit, and you are the baptized. And the baptism is the people of God. You're part of the family. Tell someone, hello, peeps. Water baptism is water. Wherever you have water. The Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, when he heard the gospel, said, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And they got in the water and baptized him. So baptism by immersion. It's a picture of the burial of Jesus. We believe he died for our sins and he was buried. He was immersed in the ground, hidden away in a tomb, and then arose from the dead. And so we go into a watery grave and rise up to walk in the newness of life. If you've not had the joy of being baptized in water since you have become a believer, I encourage you to consider it and pray about it. Now, I have to cover this. What about sprinkling if there's no water to immerse? 
I had the opportunity and refused and regret it to this day. I was a, a uh, assistant pastor of a church in Houston, the world of faith. And the world of faith had a baptistry with neon lights hanging over it. It's a wonder we didn't get killed. <laughs> the neon lights said the Lord's Prayer. Anyway, one night I got a call to go see someone in the hospitals about 2 a.m. as a young man, 21 years old, with cerebral palsy named Johnny Duck. Johnny Duck's limbs were completely withered. He was breathing on a trach, and he had had a spiritual experience. He saw the Lord Jesus Christ. He believed in him, and he wanted to talk to somebody about it. So they called the church and asked for a preacher, all right? And so uh, anybody else could have done it, but I'm the one that got the call, and I went and did it. I prayed for him to be healed. I prayed for him to go on and receive all that the Lord had for him, and then I went home went back to bed. The next day, the family called, wanted to see me again. He had seen the Lord again, and the Lord told him to be baptized. So I spoke to the nursing station, and they said, there's no way you're immersing him in water without a court order. You're going to have to see a judge. So I went in the chapel. I said, Lord, there's no way I'm going to go to a judge for permission to obey your word. Baptism is your will. I ask you to heal him in Jesus' name so I can baptize him. So I told the family I couldn't. They said, well, can't you at least sprinkle him? Oh, no, that is not scriptural. The word baptize means to immerse, to submerge. It's used in Greek language when you dye a garment. Went home. He died the next day. I felt so bad. The only preacher the family knew was me, so I got to preach his funeral, and the house was packed with people. And I preached a Billy Graham sermon for the first time, (laughs) and the Lord used it. But looking back on it, I wish I had sprinkled him and told him, if the Lord raises you up, then we can follow through and immerse it. Why? It would have given him the joy of obeying Jesus. Jesus had told him to do something, and I uh, took the joy out of him, his sails, the wind out of his sails. How can, how can a crippled guy in a hospital on IVs and a trach and oxygen, how can he obey Jesus? By at least getting a symbol of baptism. Now, I know there's water in heaven. If you don't believe it, read your Bible. So if it's that important, when he got there, they immersed him because we know he had a new body, right? But it was a learning experience, and I share that with every preacher I get a chance to. And more than once, they thank me later. Thank you so much. I was in the same position, and I'm so glad I heard your story and didn't allow my beliefs to get in the way. So is that okay? You still love me? Pastor's a compromiser. Oh, we got to finish these. Spirit baptism. The Holy Spirit, immersed in the Holy Spirit, filled, you're immersed and filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit is not water. Water's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not water. So you're not baptizing the body of Christ when you're baptized in water because the Holy Spirit's not the one baptizing you in water. Water baptism, if you're a believer, you're baptized by a baptizer, someone who does that as a ministry. Does not have to be a preacher, just a believer, right? We do it in obedience to him. We do it in his name. So spirit baptism is the believer who wants to receive all that God has for him. So who's the baptizer there? The Holy Spirit? No, Jesus. John the Baptist said, there's one coming after me, mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit baptizes you in the body of Christ. The baptizer baptizes you in water. Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. That sounds kind of tangled up, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus. So I never want to go back. Now here's one a lot of people don't know about and they don't like. The baptism of fire. 
He says he will, John said, the one coming after me, greater than me, who baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he tells what the fire is. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will gather up the chaff and burn it with unquenchable fire. The chaff in our lives, the Lord has a fan to blow on it, to blow it off of us, and it gets burned. The chaff in your life is not for heaven. Cleansed. The most extreme story of baptism of fire I know of is Job. God allowed it to happen. But restoration came. And he had a faith in God like he never had before. The least bit of pride that he had was gone. Read the whole story and don't stop till you get to the end. But beware of those smart things his friends say. They're not from the Lord. So the baptism of fire is the Lord's cleansing in our life. Sanctifying you. The Holy Spirit empowers us for ministry and the Lord baptizes us in fire so that those things from our past, you got to let them go. Sometimes the baptism of fire requires moving geographically to get away from the old friends that want to draw you back into old ways. Let it go. Sometimes the baptism of fire requires you to change churches. The Lord wants to cleanse us because he's coming back for a church, a glorious bride without spot or wrinkle. Sometimes the baptism of fire is someone coming to you and confronting you about an error in your life or a speck in your eye or an offense that they have and you have got to swallow your pride and go through the process. Come out the other side, you're a whole lot more like Jesus. All right, so that's the doctrine of baptisms. Then we have the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. This is Old Covenant theology and New Covenant theology. Now the word resurrection is nowhere to be found in the Old Testament. Did you know that? The word's not in there. It's all over the New Testament. But the truth of the resurrection is all through the Old Covenant. Look at what Daniel said in Daniel 12. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to shame and eternal contempt. So there's a resurrection and eternal judgment. We live in respect of an almighty God, knowing he will raise us up and will judge everybody. Some do eternal life, some do eternal shame. Jesus said, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and it shall come forth They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells of a day when all will stand before the Lord and he'll divide the sheep from the goats. To the goats he'll say, I was hungry, I was naked, I was thirsty, I was sick, and you met none of my needs. And they'll say, when did we see you like that? He'll say, as much you did it to the least of these, you've done it to me. But to the sheep, you'll say, enter in to the life of my Father has for you. Because I was naked and you clothed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was in prison. I was sick and you visited me. Lord, when did we see you naked or thirsty or hungry or sick? And as much as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. So we'll be judged on our treatment of our fellow man. So part of the baptism of fire is to get rid of those things that would make heaven earth too. (laughs) The scriptures used to teach purgatory is actually baptism of fire scriptures for now in our life now here on earth. This is our purgatory. Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Now, this is our foundation. 
But the milk of the word is the foundation of this foundation. The milk of the word is God's love for you. May he so impact you with his love that you can't help but love everybody. Look at a couple other passages about milk. We had read this at the beginning of our text, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 through 3, Brothers, I was not able to speak to you as to spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, because you're not ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready. And here's the sign that we're not ready for solid food. Because you're still fleshly. And here's the sign of fleshliness, carnality. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and living like unbelievers? Envy is a problem in the church that nobody has. Really? It's a problem that none of us like to admit to having. Envy causes so much problems in the world. I think that's part of the Russia-Ukraine thing. Russia's envious of Ukraine. Envy in the church is so wrong when we're supposed to rejoice when our brother or sister does well. If there are certain things in your life that make you envious, make some changes. Some people need to cancel their Facebook accounts. Oh, pastor's getting all up in our business. I mean, let's face it. If you're getting hit with envy every day and praying every day, that's good. But why not make it a little easier for yourself, you know? If you keep tripping over your shoestrings, stop and tie them up. Right? Peter seconded the motion. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit. And the word all is implied because he's already said it twice. Hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. So all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, all evil speaking. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. That the Lord is gracious. That the Lord is gracious. Sometimes we forget the mercy that God has extended to us. That in ourself, there's nothing but absolute wickedness. Totally depraved we were. That's why the Son of God had to die for us. And in His grace, God extends that as full payment for our wickedness. We are blessed. We say blessed, 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 blessed. We forget it. If we've tasted the Lord is gracious, let's lay aside all this C-R-A-P stuff. I really just want to zero in on envy today. I feel like Dan Moeller. Let it go. <laughs> You got milk? Yes, I got it, Pastor. Well, next question, you got me? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He made that outside of a Samaritan village at a well. The village had a well, but outside the village was another well that a Samaritan woman of shame, she'd been married five times and she was shacking up with man number six, or who knows, maybe there was seven and eight, and she was man number nine. We don't know, but the man she was with, she wasn't married to. She came there in the heat of the day when women didn't get water, and the Lord ministered such words of life and grace and love to her, and she rushed off to the village to say, come here, man. What, another man? 
the Lord stayed there because of her ministry. Three days of ministering words of life to people. To the Samaritan people that the world hated. The Jewish world hated. The religious people hated. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. They came back and said, Master, eat. He says, I have food to eat of which you know not of. He said, did someone bring you food? No. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. What is our meat? Is it knowing who the Antichrist is? Is it understanding the third element of the fourth cycle of the 16th season of the next move of God? No. It's knowing what God's purpose is for your life and doing it with your whole heart, no matter what it costs you. We've got to have a foundation so that we can go on. Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. In the old covenant, a sacrifice had to be perfect or it wasn't accepted. That's the beauty of Jesus. He was a perfect sacrifice. Now, we're called to uh, be living sacrifices. But not at first. We're called to be recipients. We're called to be spiritual babes. We're called to soak up all the glorious truths of the love of God for us and get healed up. And he heals our scars and makes us like himself. Calls us. And then the day comes when he sends us to do that thing. In the old covenant, it was not kosher to eat milk products with meat. Had to keep them separate. A kosher pizza has cheese, no meat. It's a veggie pizza. If it was a meat pizza, there would be no cheese. Right? In Christianity, this is important. People get meat confused with milk. If you want God to love you, you got to go to the mission field. If you want to taste the grace of God, you got to give in this offering. If you want to um, be loved, you got to pay the price. You want to be called, there's a cost. It's all mixed up, you see? No. He freely brings us into the kingdom. He freely gives us his grace. He freely loves us without condition, like we are, warts and all. If we were brought into the temple as a lamb, we would be rejected. Get this blind, lame thing out of here. The Lord loves us. Case closed. Saved by grace alone. Through faith alone. But faith, if it is faith, doesn't stay alone. Noah's faith didn't stay alone. Here comes along good works, building this ark, right? But let your security be established. If you're constantly wondering whether or not you're saved, do not go to the mission field. You're still needing the milk, tasting that the Lord is gracious. If you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, evil speaking is present in our lives because we need to taste the graciousness of the Lord. And we need to know that we were not deserving of that grace. My mama said I was perfect. Well, your mama was imperfect. That's why she said you were perfect. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you have saved us like we are. Oh, man. And that you're wanting to build a foundation in our life. And Lord, I pray for those of us who are secure in who we are. We no longer wonder whether or not we're saved and we're not wrestling with being jealous of anybody and we're just walking in love, love, love. Lord, help us to see what you're calling us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And may you grow. And if you're at the milk stage, may you enjoy that milk every day. And if it's time to move to meat, may you look for what God's calling you to do. Amen. Hallelujah. You are alive.